concisely, we don't know what causes autism. Uh, we don't know what the problem is in the brain. And it, with so many different ways to manifest an autism spectrum disorder, it's not surprising that we don't have answers for that. I think in general, we think of it as a connectivity problem. There are problems with connections within the brain, but the brain is a wondrously complex organ. Uh, and when we talk about connections, we're talking about trillions of connections. And so trying to identify, well, where are the problems is very hard for us to do. So the short answer is we don't know what causes autism. It varies from kid to kid or uh, person to person in terms of what might be going on. And that's why you see a wide spectrum of problems. There are diagnostic criteria for autism spectrum disorder, primarily including two major areas. One sort of social communication difficulties uh, and the other involving um, uh, repetitive behaviors, restricted interests and activities. There's a number of um, uh, sub uh, uh, sections to those diagnoses. And our job as doctors is to try and evaluate whether or not a child or an adult meets all those criteria um, to qualify for the diagnosis of an autism spectrum disorder. The diagnostic criteria are uh, clear but fuzzy. So it, it's very clear that you're supposed to have social difficulties or social deficits. Uh, uh, however, what does that mean? Like how much of a social deficit is a social deficit? Uh, that's not clear. They give examples in uh, our Diagnostic and Statistical Manual to give you some sense or grounding for what the criteria are, but it varies from clinician to clinician and person to person, like where you're going to draw the line. It's not as clear as we would like it to be. The same with the restricted uh, interests and patterns of behavior. Um, you see kids with uh, sensory difficulties, either they're hyper or hypo-reactive to sensations. They engage in repetitive physical behaviors or they have restricted ranges of interest. But lots of people have hobbies or interests that they sort of focus on uh, and sort of where you draw the line between that's way too restrictive and way too much can be very difficult. Um, as an example, it's very common for kids between two to five to have a very restricted diet chicken nuggets, uh, spaghetti, no sauce, uh, that's about it. Um, that does not mean they're on the autism spectrum because they have those restricted uh, ranges. But you'll see kids with autism spectrum disorder have those very narrow tastes and those persist. And where you draw the line as to this is not developmentally appropriate or something we would expect is hard. That's, that's a clinician judgment uh, in terms of looking at kids how many kids you see, what, the, what is typical for kids. Um, I've, had, I, I've had kids who were really interested in a particular topic like dinosaurs at five, seven, 10. Uh, they know all the dinosaurs and all their names. Um, and I know there are adults, they work over at the Carnegie Museum and they're really interested in di dinosaurs and they know all their names. That doesn't mean that it's a restricted interest, but sometimes you see that's the consuming interest and they aren't engaged in the normal social interactions that you'd expect. The problem is there's so many different ways to uh, manifest with an autism spectrum disorder. We have kids born with significant genetic problems, significant brain injury uh, that affects their development. Um, we have kids that have no obvious physical problems, no genetic problems, nothing else going on, and they're obviously autistic. Um, and so it's, it's hard to figure out when you have that, like, how can we lump all these kids together? This kid is nonverbal, he has seizure disorder, he has intellectual disability, and this other kid has no seizures, no intellectual disability, very verbal, but they're both considered to be on the autism spectrum. Well, it's a spectrum, there's a wide range there. And when you try and come up with treatment or intervention or any kind of supports for people, you're gonna to have to look at what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, and try and work around those. Um, and try and address each of those, use their strengths to help them, uh, work around their weaknesses, or figure out ways to provide them with support if they have a problem. And there are two schools of thought on that. Some is, hey, let's work with the strengths and ignore the weaknesses, and others are, no, let's spend some time working on building up the weaknesses so they aren't weak anymore. Um, 
you could do both, um, but I think uh, you, you have to work with the patient and their family about, well, what do you want to do? What do you think is the best way to go in these circumstances? Some families are very eager to uh, help. Has no language, we've got to build up language. We have to work on something. If they can't verbalize things, we want to have sign language or we want to use a picture exchange system so they can communicate with us. We need some sort of uh, way to communicate with them. Others figure, well, we have to learn, if they can't communicate with us, we have to figure out how we can understand them. So we need to change what we do to understand where they're coming from. The data is that uh, the more functional your language, the better off you do. Because we are in a society, and if you're going to go out into society, language is the main way that we communicate with each other, both verbally and non-verbally. So to some extent, most of the therapeutic interventions are geared at trying to build up areas that uh, a child or an adult might be weak at. Um, but at some point, you may say, hey, we worked a lot on that, we've sort of plateaued, now what else do we need to do? And I, I think that's always the tricky part for parents, school systems, and for doctors, is like, okay, when do we say this is enough and we need to work in another area versus, no, we need to keep plugging away at that. Visit us online at wqed.org slash autism for more web extras, links to resources, and to watch the documentary Autism Aging Out.